right, so I made this video of me doing stuff with my hands. Just some of it pretty boring, random stuff, but stuff that I could not do without the sense of touch. It turns out that neural signals from the hand convey information about the size, the shape, the texture of objects grasped in the hand. If these objects are moving across the skin, you have information about the direction that those objects are moving in, how fast they're moving. And these neural signals from the hand make it so that you don't have to constantly look at your hand to make sure it's doing the right thing. Right? You can attend to other things while you're, you're doing things with your hand. And in fact, it turns out that without these signals, we would struggle to do basic activities of daily, daily living, like opening a doorknob, brushing our teeth. Forget about tying your shoes or buttoning your shirt. But you don't have to take my word for it. In this video made by a colleague of mine, Roland Johansson, uh, at Umeå University in Sweden, this lady is doing this very basic activity of daily living, namely lighting a match, no problem. Now, moments later, the same person is going to do the same task. The only difference is her fingertips, the fingertips of of the, the index and the thumb finger have been, or of the thumb have been numbed. And she can see what she's doing. She's not, she's not drunk. She's <laughs> ne neurologically normal. But nonetheless, this task becomes a really difficult one. She struggles to do this. In fact, she cheats a little bit and starts using her middle finger to, to get, get it done. So, Touch is important. In fact, without touch, our hands would be these oddly shaped, sort of essentially useless appendages at the end of our arms. Um, now, now, touch is really important for, for us and you, for using our, our hands. Now, imagine trying to control a robotic hand without the sense of touch. So in this video, there's a, uh, a quadriplegic patient here who has been implanted with an array of electrodes in the motor parts of her brain. And my colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh have, have uh, developed algorithms to measure these signals, read uh, and decode from these signals, uh, from these brain cells, uh, cells, the intended movements of this individual. So when she thinks about moving her arm, which she can no longer move because she's paralyzed from the neck down, insensate from the neck down, when she thinks of moving her arm up, her arm doesn't move, but the robotic arm does. So that's, that's pretty amazing, right? That's an amazing scientific and an amazing technological achievement to be able to control and move this arm with your thoughts. But if you look carefully now, right, you get over the whole Terminator arm and you, you, you look carefully, you know, She's pretty slow and clumsy at grasping these objects, right? Especially the small ones, it takes her a while. Just like you would be slow and clumsy if you try to grasp objects without the sense of touch, which of course she does not have through this arm. And so the idea is that while this is an amazing achievement, in order to make this something clinically viable, something that will improve the life of quadriplegic patients, quadriplegia is a devastating condition, you have to not only restore this, this sort of these control signals, but you also have to restore these sensory signals. And this is what we're shooting for, right? Which, forget about trying to play the guitar with other sense of touch, in addition, of course, to be able to, you know, do activities of daily living. So, how are we going to do this, right? How is it even possible? How do you start thinking about this? Well, when we touch objects, the skin gets deformed, produces activation in receptors which, that are embedded in it, and signals from these receptors, and, and the pattern of activation of these receptors d depends on what we're touching, how we're touching it, and these signals go up the arm and evoke patterns of activation in the brain, which then uh, result in sensations. Now, in these ro robotic arms, there are sensors in the, this, in, in the hands that replace the, these, these receptors in the skin, and what we're tr working on is try to develop algorithms to take the output of these sensors and convert them into patterns of electrical stimulation of the brain to evoke meaningful and hopefully intuitive touch sensations. So, to, to develop these algorithms, we carried out a series of behavioral experiments with monkeys. So, the idea was, just briefly, that we, what we did is we taught these, these, these animals to uh, uh, discriminate or judge touches delivered to their hand using this 
very high precision robot we developed in the lab. And once the animals had been trained to do these tasks, what we did is we started replacing some of these touches with electrical stimuli applied to the brain. And we wanted to assess whether the animal responded to these electrical stimuli as they would have responded to a touch that they replaced. Right? So that's the general, the general idea. OK, so, so if you pick up an object, what is the minimal in information that you need to know about this object? Right? Well, you need to know what part of the hand is touching the object. You need to at least touch it with a thumb and one of your fingers. Okay? Now, in the intact person, right, we know that, and, and a lot of you know, have already probably seen this, if you look at the parts of the brain that receives input from the skin, called the somatosensory cortex, you have a full body map. Okay? So that means that there's neurons here that respond to the arm, neurons here that respond to the hand, neurons here that respond to the face. And what we showed in a series of experiments is that if you, if you stimulate neurons that respond to a specific patch of the skin, the animal feels as though that patch of skin was touched. So for instance, if you stimulate neurons that respond to the index finger, the animal feels as though its index finger was touched. Okay, so that phenomenon can be used to, to convey that information about contact location through electrical stimulation of the brain. More on that later. Now, another thing you need to know when you're picking up an object is how much pressure you're exerting on it, right? You need to press, uh, apply enough pressure so as to pick it up, but not so much pressure that you're going to crush it. And touch conveys very precise information about how much pressure you're exerting on objects. So we hypothesize that one way to sort of convey these sensations, now, if you think about it, if, I, if you have a very light touch, low pressure, you get this very faint sensation. If you have a very strong touch or high pressure, you get this very strong sensation. And we hypothesize that we could mimic that, that sort of sensory continuum simply by, uh, so we could uh, produce percepts of increasing pressure by increasing the current that was applied to the brain. So, in a series of experiments, we uh, developed this, this function here um, that relates pressure to electrical amplitude. And I can't go into that, the, the, the specific experiments that we, uh, I don't have time to, to describe these experiments in detail, but the, 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 the take home message was, this function allows us to take some level of pressure and figure out how much current to stimulate the brain with to produce an appropriate percept, so that if there's a low pressure, you'll get an appropriately low uh, artificial percept. If it's a high pressure, you'll have an appropriately high or, or strong percept. So I'm not gonna tell you how we got to this function. Lots of experiments were involved in that, but I will tell you how we tested it. The way we tested it is we had animals do a pressure discrimination task. So now we were touching the animal twice, and the animal's task was to say which of these touches was, was stronger, the first or the second. So we can train these animals to do this task. It's like a pressure discrimination task. And then we had the animal do the exact same task, but instead of now touching their, their hand and having th them do judgments based on their hands, we, had, we touched the prosthetic finger with sensors on it, right? We took the output of these sensors and in real time converted the output of these sensors into patterns of electrical stimulation of the brain of appropriate amplitude. And then we saw if the animal, how well the animal could discriminate pressure based on this artificial sensation these artificial signals. And of course, I wouldn't be having this conversation right now if it hadn't worked. It turns out that we could get the animal to do exactly as well, whether on this pressure discrimination test, whether we were touching its hand or touching the prosthetic hand, right? And so getting all this information via this artificial touch. So how does this all come together, all right? So we've done these experiments, but ultimately what we're interested in is restoring touch in a patient uh, equipped with the, uh, this prosthetic arm. How is that going to work? So remember, what we're ultimately trying to do is take, take the output of these sensors on this, on this prosthetic hand and convert them into patterns of electrical stimulation applied to the brain that produce meaningful and intuitive percepts. Okay? So first you need to wire the electrodes to the right sensors. How do you do that? Well, I showed you that if I electrically stimulate an electrode, that the person is going to feel it somewhere on their body, right? 
So, so for instance, if I stimulate electrode number 43 on the electrode array, the patient might say, I feel that on my index fingertip. What you do then is you take the sensor on the index fingertip and you connect to electrode, what is it, 43? And so anytime the, index, the, the prosthetic index finger touches something, there's going to be, uh, uh, electrical stimulation is going to be delivered through electrode 43 and therefore evoke a percept that is going to be felt on the index finger. So then, how do I stimulate through electrode 43? Well, this, this function I showed you earlier is a function that takes whatever the, the, the current uh, or the, the, the output of that pressure sensor is and tells you how much to stimulate the brain. So if you're not touching anything, you don't stimulate the brain at all. And if you have faint uh, or low pressure, you have a low amplitude of stimulation, high pressure, high amplitude of stimulation. So it creates this mapping that, that creates a, an appropriate percept so that the, the, the pressure sensation, this artificial pressure sensation, will match the pressure sensation that you would experience given that amount of pressure. So, so these are really two very basic types of information, contact location, contact pressure. But even with this, we anticipate that the functionality of these prosthetic arms is going to increase considerably. The ability to do this task of grabbing objects and move them is going to increase considerably. And therefore, restore sensory motor function to these individuals who have lost it, and, uh, and, there, and thereby restoring this, their independence and sort of alleviating this, uh, this very devastating condition that is tetraplegia. You know, another fun thing about this, in, in, including touch, is that patients are going to start embodying this robot as being part of their own body, right? Because anytime they touch something, they're going to feel it as you would if you touch something. And suddenly this robot is going to be part of their, their body. So that's going, to, that's going to contribute to sort of uh, these patients embracing this technology. Um, now, if you go and sort of think ahead, you know, we're talking about uh, um, alleviating this the quadriplegia, but if you look ahead and you think about this potential to interface directly with machines, so your brain is send, sending signals to machines directly, machines are sending signals directly back to your brain, suddenly there's all kinds of possibilities that open up. And so we can start thinking about and sort of maybe fantasizing about what those possibilities might be. But to get back to Earth and though now, sometime in the next few weeks, uh, there's going to be a, a quadriplegic patient that's going to be implanted with an array in his or her motor cortex and an array in sensory cortex. And for the first time in human history, this person is going to reach over, grasp an object with a, a robotic hand, and be able to actually feel the object through the robotic hand. And I feel like that line, <laughs> that line between science and science fiction will have been pushed back a little bit. So thanks a lot, and I'm happy to take a couple of questions. What powers the arm? What powers the arm? Batteries. Electricity. Motors and batteries. Yes. Are the implants in the brain permanent? Yes, at least current. Oh, right, I should repeat the question. Are the, are the uh, implants in the brain permanent? The answer is yes. Oh, yes, hi. I, I was wondering, how does uh, your approach compare to uh, the, the approach where they uh, actually try to connect the signals to uh, residual nerves? Right, the, so that, I'm also involved in that approach. That's just not what I chose to talk about today. today. The difference is for quadriplegic patient, that approach doesn't work because the nerve is no longer attached to the brain. But otherwise, that's a great approach. In fact, one that's going to that's happening now and, and, and is probably more ready for prime time. How soon do you think uh, people with healthy arms would choose to go with a robotic arm instead of their own healthy arm? I try not to think about that. <laughs> I had a question over I'm here. I'm a scientist. I had a question over here. Is, is that map, so you said 43 is the index finger, is that common or is that something that has to be mapped out for each individual? Right, so, I, you know, so it turns out there's a, a full body map and so based on anatomical markers, look, based on the, the patterns of, of, of gyri and sulci, we know where the hand representation is, right? So then you target 
you put your array in that hand representation, but even within the hand representation, the digits are very well organized. So the thumb is always, you know, lateral to the to the index finger is always lateral. So, and as these technologies improve, these arrays become larger and denser. Then you can have better and better resolution. Um, so, sorry. So talk. So talking about that map, when you have a spinal cord injury, how do you take into account any neural uh, reorganization that might happen in the person after the injury when Excellent. you're implanting the electrodes? I love that question. It's almost as if I planted it there. So there's this idea <laughs> that, that the brain is really plastic, right? And, so, and, and especially it's well documented that especially after, after amputation, the parts of the brain that used to respond to the arm suddenly responds to the face. Right? So you're like, well, if it's remapping so much, why are you even trying to figure out how the native brain works? Because this brain is completely different from the native brain. But it turns out, in this beautiful series of studies, uh, it's been shown that this reorganization actually does not happen in the brain. It happens in the cuneate nucleus. The brain doesn't seem to change that much. So, which makes us hopeful that our approach will work. Um, I'm following the microphones. All right, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I have a question about how far you're going to take this. Can you uh, create something artificial that will do better than the human would do without it? In other words, could you improve the quality of a pianist or uh, somebody who works with their hands and things? In theory, yes. You know, so I showed you, I, well, I told you that, that these, these, these animals are as good at pressure discrimination as we, as with their skin as they are with a prosthetic hand. But all I have to do is turn up a, a knob and suddenly they're m much better, right? So, so could you take so an ordinary person who has certain good qualities and make them better? So again, it's one of those things that is a little, it's a little scary to think about, but it's definitely, the potential is there. It's not there right today, yeah, but you know, as the technology improves, it's definitely something to so think about. So might, we might reform our, our whole way of living. That's one of the things I was sort of alluding to when I said the possibilities are endless. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for questions now. Thank you, Selena.